Welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and is shown nationwide. When Marines enter an abandoned house in Fallujah, Iraq, and they hear a suspicious noise, they clench their weapons, they edge around the corner, and they prepare to open fire. What they find during the U.S.-led attack on the, quote, most dangerous city on Earth, however, is not an insurgent bent on revenge, but a tiny puppy left behind when most of the city's population fled before the bombing. Despite military law that forbids the keeping of pets, the Marines deflee the pup with kerosene, they deworm him with chewing tobacco, and they fill him up on meals ready to eat. Thus begins the dramatic rescue attempt of a dog named Lava, and Lava's rescue of at least one Marine, Lieutenant Colonel Jay Kopelman, from the emotional ravages of war. So joining me for today's show is the retired Lieutenant Colonel Jay Kopelman, author of From Baghdad with Love, A Marine, The War, and A Dog Named Lava. Welcome. Thank you, Diane. I am delighted you're here. Oh, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And I'm Diane Sullivan, your host for today's program. Jay, I wonder if you would take us back to the fall of Fallujah and tell us a little bit what that was like. Um, Fallujah, at the time that we went in for that battle in November of 2004, was a, uh, an insurgent stronghold. Uh, it, was, it was a bastion of insurgent activity. They had a real stranglehold on the city and were determined to make that their, their line in the sand where they were going to stand and fight the Marines who were coming in to liberate the city and, mm -hmm. and release the stranglehold that they had on the city and the, and the civilian population there. So it was, a, it was known at that time as the most dangerous city on earth and uh, it was certainly one of the fiercest battles that anybody will remember for a long time in, in Marine Corps lore it is said to be the most uh, the, the the most intense and the most dangerous urban fighting since the battle of way city in vietnam as i understand it you signed up for this duty why well i was uh, a civilian in 2001 uh, when 9 11 happened i was still in the marine corps reserves and i realized as soon as i saw the second plane fly into the World Trade Centers that if we weren't at war then we soon would be and I wasn't going to sit on the sideline and let somebody else go fight my fight for me. That's what Marines do. We, we, we go places nobody else wants to and, and we fight for other people and I wasn't going to sit around and let somebody else do that. Thank you for that. Tell us a little bit what it was like in Iraq before the march into the city. Well, I was there briefly in 2003, just for a few months, and then again, I was there for about a month before the invasion, a month and a half before the invasion of Fallujah in November of 2004. During my first tour in Iraq, it was at the very outset of the war uh, in March of 2003. It was very different from anything I experienced my second time around. There, there weren't the uh, improvised explosive devices that have become so prevalent and have caused so many deaths and, uh, and traumatic injuries to young Marines and soldiers that there wasn't the animosity from the general population that I think so many people are, are facing now and that we saw a little bit when I was there. Uh, it, it's two completely different times in the history or, or the, the progression of, of this war. You know, early on, people were always very happy to see us. Uh, and now, the, the numbers of people who are happier, fewer and fewer. You know, it, it said that in the first six weeks of any military operation, you're, when you go into a country the way we did, you're, you're viewed as a liberator. And, and then, as you stay longer and longer, and there, there are fewer and fewer improvements in quality of life and, and just basic services and, and availability of fresh foods, now you become seen as an occupier, and so fewer and fewer people appreciate your presence. 
Tell us a little bit about the Lava Dogs. Uh, the Lava Dogs are a group of Marines from Hawaii. The battalion that they're from is 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines, and they're from Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. They were the Marines who first found Lava, the, the dog who is prominently featured in my book, uh, hiding in, in a house in Fallujah the day that they went into the city. Each, each battalion that went into Fallujah, whether it was Marine Corps or Army, was given a sector that was theirs to work through, to clear, and then ultimately secure. And uh, they were in the northeast portion of the city, and as they were clearing houses for their headquarters command post, uh, in one of the rooms they heard a noise and there was, there was lava. So the lava dogs named the dog for themselves. Wonderful story. Tell us a little bit more about how you felt when you first saw lava. Well, when I first saw lava, I, I had just been in from patrol myself, and uh, y you know you're still a little bit on edge when that happens. And when you s don't expect to see something, it's not really there. So when Columbus first sailed west and hit the West Indies, the the natives didn't for I don't know, days or weeks couldn't envision ships on the horizon. They had never seen them. And so when you don't expect to see something, it's not really there, and it takes time to assimilate that. But when I first saw Lava, he was in this house that was being used as a command post, and I didn't know they had the dog. And so this streak just came rolling across the floor, and I thought somebody had accidentally dropped a hand grenade. Um, so you know, I jumped back at first and saw this thing, and then natural instincts kind of took over and, and then after a moment I relaxed and I saw the dog and I guess my next thought was why do they have a dog here in this house in the middle of combat you know it's against regulations you're not mm -hmm. supposed to do that so I want to read something from your book very early on page seven as I recall you say quote I like the way he felt in my hands I like that he forgave me for scaring him I like not caring about getting home or staying alive or feeling warped as a human being. Just him wiggling around in my hands, wiping all the grime off my face. You recall that feeling? Sure, sure. And I think that, you know, you're, you're far from home and war and combat are not normal states of being. That's, it's kind of the antithesis of living and yeah. human life. And so, you, you find something that reminds you of home, you know, because I think most kids have grown up either with a puppy dog or they've known somebody who had a dog and they've played with that dog and, and it's just a very relaxing, um, you know, non-threatening feeling to, ha to be able to hold that dog and, and remind you of the way things should be, not the way things are. Initially, what did you see as the options for this starving five-week-old puppy? Well, there, w there were no options. Initially, it was, you know, he's going to have to go at some point because the Marines aren't going to be there forever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, he could become a distraction. Um, what were his chances of survival anyway? He, he couldn't be in good health. Uh, you know, he'd been on his own for who knows how long. Uh, he certainly was covered with fleas. He, he had worms. I, I mean, the dog was weaned far too early from his mother. So what options were there? Probably the best thing would have been to destroy him humanely and, and, and not look back. But you didn't do that. No, nobody did that. Nobody wanted to. Um, certainly the Marines who found him when I approached him about it and I said, well, what do you think is going to happen? What do you want to have happen with this dog that you're harboring in, in your command post? They said they wanted him to go live with them in Hawaii, but that wasn't an option either. Uh, number one, the quarantine <coughs> regulations in Hawaii are, are just far too strict to try to get a dog from Iraq there. And then they had come to Iraq on a ship from Okinawa, so they would have to take the dog home to Okinawa first on a ship and then fly back to their base in Hawaii. And it was 
it really w wasn't a very good likelihood that any of that would take place. Yeah. You describe in your book the Marines as well-oiled machines of war that are trained to kill. Mm -hmm. Then tell me why they didn't kill this puppy. Well, what the puppy hadn't done anything to them, and uh, you know, I, I think that they became attached to him. They they decided they recognized as I did that this is a symbol of something normal and it's it gives you that sense of home that doesn't come in an email and doesn't come in a care package but here's a living breathing tangible thing that provides them feelings of security that they couldn't find somewhere else right. what was it like patrolling the streets at this point um, initially it could get to be pretty humorous the Iraqi soldiers that I had taken into the city had maybe a week's worth of training most of them had never been in the military before so they didn't understand what to do or how to do it everything mm -hmm. with them was kind of make it up as you go along and try to teach them as things were happening so it, a lot of it was very reactive I say humorous uh, one of the Marines that I was with uh, referred to it as <coughs> taking uh, taking Miss Moppet's third grade class on a field trip because they were just kind of incredulous and didn't get what was really happening. You know, the ones who stuck around at least didn't understand that around any corner was a sniper waiting to kill them. And um, so it was dangerous, of course, but there were moments of comic relief during the whole thing. And you were brought in specifically to help train these people. Right, I, I was initially uh, in Iraq to help train the Iraqi Special Forces and then when we began the planning for the invasion of Fallujah was subsequently assigned to help bring an Iraqi army battalion into the city of Fallujah for that battle and they would then be assigned further to work with the lava dogs and be mentored by them and, and work uh, manning checkpoints with them and patrolling with them. Is that or was that realistic, do you think, at the time? Oh, absolutely it was because that w it, it was realistic, um, I guess, on a number of levels. First of all, we had to teach them. They, mm -hmm. they had to begin to learn to be responsible for their own sovereignty and their own security. Um, but it also, uh, I guess, the term that was used frequently and then our commanding general said we're not going to use it anymore was put an Iraqi face on the operations that we were conducting, that we didn't want it to appear that it was just an American fight, but it, that it truly was a coalition fight, which it was. And it's, mm -hmm. it's important that the Iraqis participated in, in this, especially in this battle, because of how, how much um, media attention it had and because of how important it was uh, symbolically that we get rid of the insurgents in Fallujah and take it back for the people. So it was, it was critical that the Iraqis play an important part in winning this battle and that they often, uh, as often as possible, take the lead in some of the operations. Now you said a few moments ago that the other guys were thinking that lava would end up back in Hawaii with them. What were you thinking? I was thinking it wouldn't happen. I, I just couldn't see that. I knew that the quarantine regulations were very, very strict in Hawaii. Uh, minimum six months. If you bring a dog from Massachusetts to Hawaii, the dog is going to sit in quarantine for six months. I, I just couldn't see Hawaiian authorities, if they got that far, yeah. even letting a dog off the airplane in Hawaii. So I just didn't feel that that was an option for them. Uh, but I finally said, look, you're not going to get the dog to Hawaii, but I promise that I will find a way to get the dog to the United States where he'll live a safe life and he'll be happy. And I had no idea at that point how to do that, but now I've made my promise and I better keep it. Did you have, like, I guess perhaps you've answered the question, but hindsight being as it is, did you think it would be as difficult as it was when you made that promise? 
Uh, I think if I had thought about that, I wouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. So I would say no, that I, I didn't think it would be as difficult as it was. Um, but, you know, I, I opened my mouth and inserted my foot, so <laughs> now I've got to, I better bite off and chew before, you know, before I can't keep my promise. Mm -hmm. So in part, your decision to rescue Lava was honoring your commitment to the guys you were with. Oh, that was, that was a huge part of it. it um, it's incumbent as, a, as an officer in the Marine Corps, as a leader, especially in combat, that you keep your word. Um, you, you know, w we take great pride in the Marine Corps of leading from the front. So your, your troops eat before you do, they sleep before you do, they, they get the best equipment before you do. Everything is about them and it's about setting the example. And if you can't do that, if I couldn't keep my promise to these kids about getting their dog home and making sure that he had a place to live, then you can't expect that they will trust you with their lives when the bullets start flying. So. It was, it was all important to me that I keep my word on that. Because you bring up having the troops sleep before you sleep. Take us back to Lava. You didn't want him to sleep with you in the beginning. Um, no, well, Lava initially slept on the roof of the house. He, you know, nobody wanted this dog in the house because he wasn't housebroken yet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, it's cramped quarters. Um, Ultimately, though, when the weather started to turn about mid-November, it started to rain quite a bit. It was very, really cold. And so we brought him in the house, and then uh, I had a box that I put him in. I, he started sleeping in that. I, I threw a fleece pullover in there, and he slept in there. But uh, I, I woke up one morning, and I couldn't get comfortable in my sleeping bag. and. Uh, when I realized what it was, it was lava had somehow crawled in my sleeping bag that night and was down at the foot of the bag and I couldn't move and I guess that was the start of it. I was going to say, and that was it, wasn't it, Jay? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, at this point, we need to take a break and we'll be right back, so please stay tuned. We'll be right back with you. Different words describe different people. But in the eyes of the law, there's one that fits us all. Human right number seven. We're all equal before the law. What are human rights? Find out at youthforhumanrights.org. Welcome back to the Educational Forum. We are discussing with the author the book with Love from Baghdad. Just simply a terrific, terrific book that we all should read. Tell us about Anne Garrels. Uh, Anne is a correspondent, a foreign correspondent with National Public Radio. And she has covered wars all over the world, the Middle East, uh, Bosnia, the uh, former Soviet republics. She's, if there's been a, a war during her career as a correspondent, she, she's covered it. And Anne was embedded with 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines, with the Lava Dogs when they entered the city of Fallujah. And she was one of their embedded correspondents when they found lava. She was concerned, as I recall from your books, that she felt that she may not be reporting things exactly how, is it, how, how it was, or at least not really portraying the lava dogs as they were. So I want to read something um, that she wrote. She says, quote, during the fighting, the battalion gained a new member, a tiny puppy they named Lava Dog. Though filthy themselves, they've lovingly washed him down to get rid of the sand fleas. He sleeps nestled in a marine poncho. Yeah, that was uh, part of one of Anne's reports from Fallujah. She used to, um, you know, she had this whole setup with computer and phone and the whole deal that she could call the producers back at NPR. 
and she would write her story and then in the middle of the night she would have to call her story in so that they could then broadcast it on NPR you know the next morning here in the United States. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and she becomes ac actively involved in Lava's Rescue. It eventually, uh, at my behest, yes, she did. Uh, I don't know if it was grudgingly or, or not, or if she did so uh, willingly, but Annie became very important to, to Lava's Rescue, uh, particularly after she had left Fallujah and was back in Baghdad covering the elections. Right. At one point in the book, you discuss what's going on in Iraq, and you really compare the insurgents to, quote, a freakish version of a video game. What did you mean by that? Uh, I think that was talking about, uh, at one portion in, in the book, the fighting that we were seeing in Fallujah, that, you know, these guys would just pop up, and it, it's like going into a video arcade with one of the games where they have a pistol or a rifle, and as you shoot them, another one pops up from somewhere else. Uh, you know, it's like a, it's like a, a, a life side, you know, real life Hogan's Alley, where it, there are just bad guys in every window and in every doorway and around the corner of every building. And it seemed that no matter how many we killed, there would somehow be more of them that would just kind of come up from under the ground and take their place. And amidst all of this, you stay committed to saving this tiny puppy. Yeah, uh, I guess everybody did, that, that lava, again, as I said, became just so important to people. And he came to symbolize, I think, the greater hope that everybody had for Iraq and the Iraqi people. Tell us about General Order 1A. Uh, General Order 1A is promulgated by United States Central Command out of Tampa and it's essentially don't be an ugly American order. So there are, there are a number of parts to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it covers uh, how you should behave in somebody else's country. Uh, don't go into a mosque unless you're invited. You know, don't have interpersonal relations with the, the local population. Uh, and it also says don't make friends with, don't adopt, don't care for any kind of animals, don't have pets. And that's all, it's, it's an all-encompassing order, but obviously the part that's important to my book is the part about keeping pets and mascots, which we did with Lava. He was both a mascot and a pet. Why didn't the military want you to have a pet? Well, there are some very good reasons for it mm -hmm. uh, under most circumstances. Uh, number one, the, these feral dogs and cats can carry diseases and they do. Um, if you have a force that is now degraded because somebody has been bitten or a couple people have been bitten and, and have rabies, then it, you can't fight. You're not as combat ready as you should be. And it doesn't matter how technologically advanced your weaponry is or how superior it is to the enemy. If you don't have people there to use it, then it's, it's just parts on a shelf. Um, the other reason is that the dog could cause a distraction. It could cause somebody to be thinking about the dog when they should be thinking about what's happening around them. People mm -hmm. can become careless. Uh, and in some circumstances, the dog could potentially give away your position at a very inopportune time, which again could result in lost lives. So there are some good reasons uh, under most circumstances not to have these animals around. They were also, in many cases, dangerous. There, there were uh, starving animals all through Fallujah when we invaded. People had left long before we came in, left animals in the streets, uh, in Arab culture, dogs aren't typically kept as house pets the way they are in the West anyway. So you've got a number of wild dogs roaming the streets. And as we were killing insurgents, the dogs were using them as a food source. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty disturbing thing, whether or not somebody's been shooting at you, that w after you've killed them, to see an animal now mm. using that person as, as its uh, sustenance. 
What were the good reasons for keeping lava? Uh, as I said, he, he gave the Marines that sense of home that they couldn't get anywhere else. And I think that ultimately he gave everybody, you know, a reason to get through the day, to mm -hmm. make it back one more day, to care for him, and to make sure that he was safe. You know, that's, that's one thing that we're really all about is when you enter combat, you, you don't think about yourself. You, you don't worry about living or dying. You worry about doing the right thing for that guy on the left and the guy on the right that they depend on you more than you depend on yourself. And so now you're thinking about doing the right thing for the guy on the left, the right, and the dog waiting back in the barracks. Right. You know, so it, it's not that you really consciously are aware of him back there during a patrol or in the middle of combat. But when you get back at the end of the day, now you've got this, this animal that needs help, mm -hmm. needs your attention. And so you want to make sure you're there to give that to him. You say somewhere in your book that despite the bombs, the terrible situation, you personally felt like you belonged there? Sure. Um, uh, you know, I, I said earlier that I wasn't going to let somebody else fight my fights for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that all Marines feel that way, that if there's, a, if there's a fight to be fought somewhere, that we should be a part of it. And, you know, I, I don't know if that's my fate you know I'm not like Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump that it's <laughs> you know that it's my birthright to die on on a field of battle somewhere but uh, it certainly wouldn't have felt right to be back here while other people were going through that okay let's talk about the rescue you decide now at some point that you want to get lava home mm -hmm. to the United States who do you contact here, and how does that go initially? I uh, called a friend, mm -hmm. sent an email, and then uh, and initially it's, uh, you want to do what? <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I had to get in touch with a friend back in the States to see if maybe he knew somebody who knew somebody. And as it turns out, he did and was able, after some phone calls and emails, to get the right connections to the Helen Woodward Animal Center in San Diego, whose president uh, was a former Marine. And when he heard about this uh, from the founder's grandson, who's the chairman of the board, he said, well, we're going to do this and we're going to help get the dog back and gave the mission to his uh, director of public relations to, to start making some phone calls and finding out what needed to be done to get lava to the U.S. A problem arises in the sense that you now received a transfer notice. They're going to move you to Camp Fallujah. Right. Well, I was being pulled out of the city and would only be at Camp Fallujah for five or seven days before reassignment north of Baghdad. And uh, so I took lava with me, took him back to the base because I figured nothing was going to happen for him in the city. He needed to be at least somewhere near me and decided at that point I needed to find a way to get him back to the States because I was leaving. I was going to be gone within the week uh, for at least six weeks and wouldn't be able to take care of him. I couldn't take him with me where I was going and I had to find a way to have him cared for and potentially, you know, if the moment came that they could get him where he needed to go so that he could come to the U.S. So, who takes on the job of taking care of lava? Well, first the lava dogs had him for a couple days, and then when it was uh, decided that he couldn't stay there any longer, I, I took him to a group of Marines who were uh, responsible for guarding our commanding general. They were his personal security detail. And they had their own building that they lived in. Yeah, behind that building was, a, was an open area where they parked their, their Humvees and they said they would take him. I had served with some of those Marines 10 years previously and I figured that if uh, one of those Marines had been, re you know, if I could trust him with my life, he was our, my team parachute rigger at one point, I figured if I could trust everybody with Rob's life there, then I could certainly trust, 
trust these guys to take care of a puppy for a little bit. Are you worried every moment that the wrong person's going to discover lava and shoot them? You know, you think about it, and I think you become kind of resolved that that's a very real possibility mm -hmm. because it was against regulations to have pets. Um, these guys, I, I don't know how they kept everybody away, but ultimately they were able to do it. And they took care of Lava for two months, I think. They kept him with them in Fallujah at this base. I, I made one or two trips back there where I was able to see him while I was away. And, and then r again, right before I was reassigned to the Syrian border. But uh, otherwise, it was all on these guys. We would send emails back and forth when I was at different postings, but otherwise, it was it was in their hands. Lava's fate was <coughs> was in their hands, and it was up to them to take care of him. And Lava is no longer a five-week-old puppy no. that fits in your hand. He's, no. he's growing and into mischief and all the rest. R right. By the time they got rid of him, he was four months old and you know twenty-something pound dog already. So it wasn't like they could easily hide him the way I did initially, carrying him in a backpack, so. Yeah. Yeah. Now you decide that it's time to get Lava into Baghdad's green zone. And some say as bad as Fallujah is, trying to cross over into the green zone into Baghdad is even worse. Well, it's just difficult. There's a lot of security. So getting into that part of Baghdad is very difficult. If you're military and in military vehicles, it's, you, you have your special lane that you get to go in. But anybody else either has to walk through a checkpoint or drive through. And it can be very, very difficult if you don't have the right credentials. Um, the problem for Lava was that Ultimately, there was beginning to be a lot of pressure to put down dogs and cats, and the military had contracted with companies to do just that on the basis. So he had to go. They had to do something with him. And we had mentioned Ann Garrels earlier. She was back in Baghdad covering the elections in January of 2005 and wasn't going to be there for long, only a month. So the timing had to be right. Uh, ultimately, the Marines who had lava on one of their missions to escort con uh, a, co a supply convoy back to Fallujah from Baghdad, they were able to take him to Baghdad to give him to Ann. But the problem was coordinating a link up because she was living in the red zone and couldn't get into the green zone very easily. But they couldn't really go running around into the red zone because that was known bad guy territory. So they had to kind of coordinate. Uh, this whole thing on cell phones and uh, I think you know it, it was just pure luck that they w were able to finally meet up the way they did and it was all very frantic and hectic and it was essentially you know the Marines walking out and carrying this puppy to hand her um, they called love all kinds of names when he lived with them because he destroyed things and he pooped and peed on things that he shouldn't have uh, but I think it was tough for them to to ultimately give him up, but it was kind of like, here, you take it, it was kind of a hot potato thing, and they tossed him to her, and then she stuck trying to get back out of the green zone with this dog, and, you know, and he caused a big commotion, I guess, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a quiet operation, that's for sure. You cried when you heard that he got to Baghdad. Did I? Yes. Oh. Your book says you cried when you heard well, that. Yeah, you don't want see to See, it got you to read it, though, okay. right? <laughs> Too macho to cry, but I'm telling you, it. it was very touching. We have to take a second break, so we'll have to come back and hear the rest of the story momentarily. Please Thanks. stay tuned. Letting you waste your life like that, yeah.
Welcome back to the Educational Forum. We are discussing with Jay Kopelman his wonderful book, With Love from Baghdad. Before we went to break, Lava is with Ann in Baghdad. Now, how long does he stay there with her? Well, with Annie, he was there for a month because she was leaving. She was being sent on another assignment and getting a break to come back to the U.S., I think, before heading back to Baghdad yet again. And the book is from Baghdad with love, not with love from Baghdad. Oh, yes. Well, so let's just, make sure yeah. we have that clear. Otherwise, okay. people won't be able to find it on Amazon. And that would be a shame. Right. Okay. Right. Got to keep love in dog biscuits. Yes. But uh, <laughs> he lived there for about um, two months total, I guess, before they finally worked up the plan to get him to the U.S. Um, so he was with Anne for about a month before she left. And then she entrusted his care to other people from NPR. There was another correspondent who came in. And then there was a producer who came through and was the last NPR person who was really responsible for lava. But the whole time he was there, there was a, a gentleman who works still for NPR and to whom my book is dedicated, who I refer to as Sam in the dedication of my book, who was the house manager, really, for these folks from NPR. And he has a family who live in Baghdad. And his mother actually lives in Los Angeles, but Sam didn't like dogs. He was afraid of dogs. You know, he thought Lava was just this disgusting beast that he didn't want to have anything to do with. And Lava can be a disgusting beast at times. <laughs> there, there's no doubt about it. But uh, what, what happened was that when Ann would go out to report, Sam was stuck in the house with Lava, and he couldn't stand that. Wouldn't have anything to do with him uh, until one day, I guess, he, he just turned you know he, he his whole attitude about lava changed and when Ann came back from working you know Sam was kicking a soccer ball around and lava was chasing it and rolling around with his nose and his front paws and they became very fast friends I guess you know that they became very close and he ultimately risked his life finding food and biscuits for lava in Baghdad and then he was the one who ultimately found for Lava an international puppy passport uh, written in Arabic and English with a, a small passport type photo of Lava stapled to it that would be needed for Lava to leave Baghdad, fly to Jordan, and then fly to the United States. You and Ann decide at one point that you want to get lava across the Syrian border, but you end up saying, well, Jordanian is the way to go. That doesn't work out. Tell us about that. Yeah, I guess the initial plan was we were going to try to get him to Kuwait for this organization, military mascots, <coughs> to then crate him and fly him back to the U.S. But uh, because Iraqis can't go to Kuwait and Kuwaitis can't, come to Iraq, there was no way to affect that transfer. Uh, so we came up with the idea, I guess Ann knew somebody in Jordan, in Amman, who had said, well, if you get lava here, we'll get him to the United States for you. <coughs> the problem was that Jordan had set up a crackdown on allowing animals in because there had been a bad rabies outbreak. Mm -hmm. Lava couldn't go that way. We tried it. Uh, we thought if with enough money, anything can be done in the Middle East, and uh, if you grease the right palms. So they put lava in, in a uh, travel crate, put it in the back of an SUV with a driver who was scared to death of this puppy, and they sent him on his way. The problem was that it was at a time uh, shortly following a, an Arab holiday, the, the Ashura, and so the borders had been closed for four days help stem the flow of traffic back and forth and it just re makes it easier for us to keep terrorists from coming in. Um, it took 12 hours to go from Baghdad to this border crossing point and it's normally about a two and a half hour drive from Baghdad to the border and then into Jordan. Uh, ultimately the car got out of Iraq, crossed no man's land, and then got to the Jordanian border where it was turned around. 
because the dog. So Lava then had a ride two and a half to three, uh, three hours back to Baghdad. So all told, he spent about 15 hours in the back of this uh, SUV in a, in a dog crate going back and forth. And Anne was gone. You know, no, I think Anne was still there, but she was leaving soon. What were you thinking when this mission, so to speak, failed? I figured that was it. There was no way we were ever going to get lava out of Baghdad or Iraq and that he would just have to live there. But Anne had told me that everybody there who was taking care of him, everybody from NPR, uh, Sam, had all assured her that if we never got lava out, he would live at that house and they would always take care of him there. And I, you know, I felt, I felt pretty good about that. I thought that was fine. That, would, that was as much as you could ask of anybody uh, to do. That, that was really the most you could ask them to do. And but you don't give up. No, uh, because there were other people trying, you know, trying other methods to get lava out of Iraq. And, you know, I, I knew that they were making those efforts, but so far none of it had come to fruition. It had all kind of been uh, well, here's an idea. No, nope, that's not going to work. Uh, you know, it's just one idea after another that wasn't bearing fruit. And finally, you know, after months of trying this, the the idea congealed that they would get dogs from a kennel in Indiana who were working with private security contractors and with the military. These very elite. Malinois and German Shepherds would be coming home for their rest and relaxation, their R&R. &R. And uh, the idea was that Lava would travel with them. So now here's this five-month-old puppy. You know, he's, he's a mutt, but <laughs> he's going to travel with these elite working dogs, these detection dogs, as they come back on leave. Posed as a detection agent. R right, yeah, <laughs> it's a, you know, a military working dog in training. And uh, th the plan is that the dog handlers from this private security company and from this kennel would bring Lava back with the other dogs, but it had to be coordinated in such a way that Lava would be taken from the red zone to the green zone, or what they now call the international zone, but nobody at NPR at that time had the credentials to cross through. So the house next door was ABC News, and they had the credentials. So they took Lava in a, and, and got him through the, the checkpoint into the green zone, where he could then be given to the guys from Triple Canopy Security and Von Lick Kennels. And it had to, you know, they had to be willing to do this but, you know, the dog handlers are, are dog people anyway, so they understood. And they said, sure, if you can get him to us, you know, we're not going to make any promises that he'll clear Jordanian customs, but we'll at least get him on an airplane out of Baghdad and, and get him to Amman where we can then forward him further to the United States. So it was, you know, every step of the way it's touch and go whether or not can you get him into the green zone. Okay, can you meet up with these guys at the right time? so that lava is with them. Is he going to be detected going into the green zone? Um, now they've got to drive to the airport on IED Alley, you know, where all the improvised explosive devices are set, that, you know, while all the cars make it. Will he get on the plane? When he gets to Jordan, will Jordanian Customs at, at the airport in Amman say, what is this? You know, this dog can't make it. And there were times when even these working dogs you'd have to bribe somebody to let them go through. Otherwise, they would hold them for up to 30 days in quarantine there. So there, you know, there were a number of things that could have gone wrong this whole way before he finally, you know, 24 hours after getting to Amman, was put on a f flight to Chicago. Your book reads like a suspense thriller, because it is. Yeah, I, you know, it, suspenseful for lava, that's for sure. And for you. Uh, well, yeah, you know, when you're sitting there waiting to find out what happens, even I came home before he did. So for me, that was a very difficult thing. You know, we don't leave anyone behind, and here I was. I had to leave lava behind. You never envisioned, though, from the beginning on, that lava is going to end up at home with you in California. 
you know, you probably think that that's a nice thing. It's really kind of pie in the sky stuff, but realistically, you know, that there's no way that can happen. Mm -hmm. it does happen? It happens pretty amazingly. Tell us. Let's let's talk about you coming home. Mm -hmm. What was that like coming back to California? How did you feel? Oh, you know, it's coming back to California. It's coming back to heaven. It was great, <laughs> you know, getting back into your old routine and seeing friends, and uh, it it was it was great. Except, you know, lava was still in Iraq, and I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if he would make it back to the United States or if he would just be left in Baghdad. But at least I had the, the comfort of knowing that there were people there who would always take care of him. Are you corresponding with people at this point? Oh, yeah. We were still in touch with the dog handlers and with, um, the, uh, with the folks from NPR. I still had their emails, and we were staying in touch. So mm -hmm. I knew that there was a plan in the works. I just didn't know if or when it would be executed. How much time ultimately passes before lava gets out? It was about 10 days from the time I got home till the time that he also came to San Diego. Okay, tell us about lava finally leaving Iraq. Yeah, he, they, it, you know, the stars all aligned, the planets <laughs> were in sync in orbit, and uh, they, they managed to make the handoff as advertised and, and got him to Amman. They, they flew out of uh, Queen Aliyah International Airport outside Amman, Jordan, and he landed in Chicago. He was met by the public relations director from, I, uh, from Helen Woodward Animal Center and the community relations director from IM's Pet Foods, and then also by the gentleman who owns Von Lick Kennels in Indiana and his family. They all went to Chicago to meet the plane and and be there waiting for lava and and he spent a night in a hotel with the, the guys from Iams and Helen Woodward and then the next day they put him on an airplane and flew him to the US. Um, there had been a number of requests from media for stories but because ABC had helped to get him from the red zone to the green zone we gave them an exclusive and I guess I was supposed to do an interview on Good Morning America that Monday or something, mm -hmm. and it was the weekend in April when the Pope got very sick and then ultimately passed away. So everything, every other story got preempted, but uh, ABC was able to cover Lava's arrival in San Diego and then our reunion at the Helen Woodward Animal Center. So they ran that story. A, a day or two later, you know, we weren't on the show, but they they ran a story about it, and so they covered his reunion. And ultimately, I was reunited with him at the Helen Woodward Animal Center. You know, good advertising for them, and uh, it was you know it was a great day. It was perfect Southern California weather that day, and Lava was. I think he was as happy to see me as I was to see him. So whatever union. Yeah, it was great. Tell the audience a little bit about your life today, Lava's life today. Lava's got a great life today because I, I'm the one that goes out and travels and talks about him. He gets to stay at home in California. <laughs> um, so uh, unfortunately, I don't know what it is, but the ocean just scares him to death. I can't even drive on a street where he can see the ocean from the car. He runs to the other side of my car, in the, uh, I have a big SUV and he's in the back of it, and he starts clawing at the windows on the side of the car away from the ocean. He hates the ocean. He likes the beach, he likes to run in the sand, but I don't know what it is about the waves that scares him, so we don't spend a lot of time there together, needless to say. Hmm. And but, you're a surfer. Yeah, and it would be great, you know, I see people who sometimes get these dogs they teach to ride on the front of their boards. And that would be pretty fun <laughs> to do with him, but... He's done enough, Jay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but there's a great park right near our house, and uh, Lava plays there all the time. There, it's, at first he was uh, somewhat of a celebrity there. You know, we would go to the park, and 
all the other dog owners would say, oh, here comes lava. And it's like, it's just another dog. Get over it. But he's, he's a little bit of a local celebrity there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there probably five months, five and a half months after he had gotten back to the States and we were playing. And, you know, lava, one of the things he does is he'll... He'll just sort of torment the other dogs. He's very fast, so he can tease them and then run away from them. Or he'll run up and kind of bite them. And, and want to. He wants to wrestle a lot with other dogs. So he was playing with a group of dogs one day, and um, a young boy decided to start playing with all the animals. And Lava, of course, saw this as an opportunity to wrestle with somebody else. And so he went over, and he grabbed the kid by the arm and dragged him down. And uh, a, a woman yelled at me, hey, y your dog just bit my child. I'm like, oh, great. So I went over and I, and I said to her, you know, because he's a little bit of a celebrity, maybe she knew who it was and the lawsuit's going to follow. <laughs> so I was, I was really concerned and I, I asked her right away. I said, well, does your son have any diseases I should be worried about? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I'm good with the pickup lines <coughs> and, uh, and and we're married now and have a son of our own and so yeah and one of my favorite parts of the book and I told you I read the end before I read right. the book but in any event is lava now sleeps on your stepson's bed as I understand it like well, he protected right. you right well that's by design because we don't want him sleeping in our bed and uh, <laughs> so both dogs actually, my wife had this other dog when we met, and so they both sleep with lava. And, and it is, it's good security. It's, it's nice to know that he's in there and any wrong sound, he's going to bark and growl at it. So it's, it's, uh, he's a f first line of defense. So. What do you foresee in your future? What's next? Um, I'm not really sure. I guess I should grow up and get a job someday. I hope not. Um, but I, I have a speaker's bureau that's actually based here in Newton, Massachusetts. And so they send me out to lecture. Um, and so I get paid to do that. And that seems to be OK. And then I haven't gotten a royalties check yet from my books. So maybe this year I won't have to get a job. I don't know. We'll see. But I don't know. I've got a couple of books in the works, actually. Good. Uh, that's what novel. I was hoping to yeah, hear. Yeah, I've got a, a novel, and I'm thinking about doing a children's book. I tried to start that, uh, the story of lava for a children's book, but that's the most difficult thing to write of all, I think, is kids' books. People who do that and do it well are gifted beyond my ability, so I might have to find somebody to help me with that. Well, I hope you do. I, I hope you pursue that because it is a beautiful, beautiful story. What lessons did you learn from lava and from Iraq? Well, I think that uh, one of the big lessons from this whole thing is that if, if you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to get into all the touchy feely stuff, but if you give, if you have enough hope for something, if you persevere at it and you stick with it long enough, then almost anything is possible to accomplish. And, you know, that may be the message for what's happening in Iraq now is that if we do stay with the mission and, and we teach the Iraqis and, and mentor them so that they can be sovereign and, and be responsible for their own security, then hopefully everything we've done there won't be for naught and that they will achieve some sort of freedom and democracy and have a better life, certainly better than what they're enduring now. As you were breaking military rules, as you were harboring lava. Fugitive. Right. Yeah. Were you, were you worried about what might happen to you? <laughs> no. I, you know, the, the biggest worry was what they would do to mm -hmm. lava. Yeah. That, you know, at that point in my career, there wasn't, they weren't, it's not like they're going to court martial you over it. Um, the, the worst thing is that they would have destroyed lava. Um, my immediate. I'd rather see you court martial, <laughs> sorry. Thanks. <laughs> There's something very perverse about that. Uh, but um, yeah, so 
you know, is mostly what would happen to lava. Mm -hmm. But my immediate superior was taking care of a couple of cats. People, you know, under certain circumstances were willing to turn a blind eye to this thing, you know. It, it seemed kind of, in, in the larger perspective, in the grand scheme of things, you know, what's he hurting? Are more animals making it back? Yeah, you just don't hear about it because it has to be done, you know, a little bit surreptitiously, mm -hmm. as we did with lava. Um, you can't just flaunt uh, the violation of a regulation of a standing order. So you, you have to be a little secretive when you're doing it. But dogs and cats do get out. There's a reporter for the Washington Post who has set up an animal shelter in Afghanistan. So it, it's happening. Are there things people in the audience can do to help the plight of some of the animals or the people? Um, geez, you know, there, I, I, I'm not really sure what organizations there are that you can get involved with to help the Iraqi people. Um, I would say one thing that's always helpful is to continue to be supportive of the U.S. troops who are there. Don't, don't forget about them. Continue to support them. And I don't mean just by s slapping a yellow magnet on your car, but you know, when you see people who have served, just tell them you appreciate their service, whether you agree with the policies or the war or not. Uh, as far as the animals go, um, you can donate money. There's an organization called Military Mascots. Uh, I think she's actually in Vermont or New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And Bonnie will take your money. Bonnie Buckley? Yeah. Uh, so. Um, you donate a pro proceeds from your book to two different funds. Well, I give, well, the one charity, I was on the board of directors, and we've since shut down operations because we, we accomplished our mission. The, the charity was called the Enduring Freedom Killed in Action Fund, and the uh, aim of the organization was to provide money to families of military members who were killed in action but whose benefits had somehow been misdirected or the, f the, the people who really need it weren't getting it. For example, if a young Marine was married and then divorced but had children with the first wife and then maybe remarried, he had left the money to the second wife and now his kids wouldn't get the money they were entitled to. Or it would go to his parents if he wasn't remarried and now the, the children mm -hmm. from the first marriage weren't getting them. So we would raise funds for those people. Uh, and part of the reason was because the, the death gratuity was so small. The, the life insurance, it was, it was you know, you know, only $150,000, I think. And then Congress passed the law to raise that to 400000 mm -hmm. And part of what our group did was lobby uh, Congress to have the limits raised so that the life insurance would now pay up to $400,000. Thank you for that. Yeah, so once, once that goal was achieved, you know, and we were just left with some money, we started going back and looking at people we had given money to previously who might need more. And I think that that's what they're doing. They're in the final stages of dispersing that money. But the other organization is called Freedom Is Not Free. And um, they're, they're almost like a clearinghouse for other charities that help the military and their families. And they're based Jay, in San Diego. we're out of time. I'm so sorry. But for okay. everything Great. that you've done, I thank you for all you'll continue to do. Best of luck. Thanks, thank you Diane. so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, thank you for having me today. Audience, thank you and be well.